new episode of the brand called you today i have a very very accomplished young person apoor chamaria welcome to the show thank you ashutosh thank you for having me thank you apoor is the, currently the chief revenue officer of rate gain which is the leading saas company he's from mayo college he's been to harvard business school he's currently pursuing his phd from iit delhi he was the youngest country head of randbaxi which is now sun pharma he worked with hcl technologies as the global head of corporate marketing he is amongst the top 10 angel investors he's authored two books and he's widely recognized and awarded my god what an incredible career at such a young age abu tell Thank me a little you. bit about uh, your early journey so i come from a very small place in bihar called katiyar okay uh, it's in north bihar gets flooded almost every year uh, very little education and my father ran the traditional business there mm-hmm. so very early on i was always taught uh, that during vacations you have to help out with the business and i ended up doing all kinds of odd jobs from you know calling people to follow up on collections mm-hmm. uh, he used to run a printing press to learning designing sense of aesthetics okay. to running production shifts okay. um, and then he opened a hotel so i ended up helping a lot there mm-hmm. so it very early on developed in me a sense of responsibility okay and taking ownership for outcomes working with people and being disciplined i see very interesting and uh, once you left bihar and you'd finished your education which was the first place you started working at so my first place was uh, i was actually working with a newspaper called indian express yeah where um, i was like a trainee journalist mm-hmm. and i was doing a second training in ready fusion which was a advertising agency okay so i was a account planner there okay and then i went on to work with a company called trident yeah so trident is a punjab based group mm-hmm. where i was hired to set up their corporate communications department okay and this was straight after indian institute of mass communication right so they trusted a rookie to set up a corporate yeah. communications yeah. department yeah. and uh, i think it was a great learning because i learned how to just use common sense to set up the department uh, network with senior alumni who were uh, running corporate communications department get advice from them mm. and uh, it was a very very good experience setting wow. it up there wow and then after that you moved to uh, i moved to ranbaxi so i did my mba and then moved to ranbaxi mm. um uh, i was doing my summer training there they were kind enough to offer me a job okay and i worked in the international business setting up country operations right so i became one of the youngest country managers i set up australia and new zealand for them and it was a great learning because ranbaxi was a billion dollar company uh, that year ds brar was the ceo of the yeah. year and uh, uh, the learning was how do you really really in a behemoth uh our country was like a million 2 million dollar of business how do you actually jockey for resources mm-hmm. build relationships yeah. and get people aligned to correct your outcome correct so tell me you know uh from mass communication which is indian express to pharmaceuticals and to technology which is hcl yeah. and which is where you are now yeah. why these or how did you make these amazing shifts So I always think I should say that uh, uh, I'm one of those people who have one eye firmly on the future. Okay, and I think that helps uh, as an investor, as an entrepreneur. And uh, uh, when I was in business school, when my batchmates were uh, trying to get jobs into levers and Nestle, mm. I was always looking at working in a more knowledge-driven, more mm. knowledge-intensive mm. industry. Uh, and i wanted a international career so ranbaxi was one of the few companies which was doing that correct and when i was doing ranbaxi uh, i had friends who were in tech and i could even in 2003 4 4 see that tech is going to fundamentally change the world mm. and impact it in ways we cannot even imagine mm. uh, so that led me to a career in tech okay i spent about 13 and a half years with hcl pretty wow. global career yeah. worked in different countries mm. and um, then i saw services being commoditized mm. it services mm. and uh, i wanted to really work and build a product business that led me to uh, joining rate gain okay. yeah so that it's a good segue into rate gain tell me about uh, the business of rate gain and uh, what are you doing in india 
So Readgain was founded in 2004 mm-hmm. by Bhanu Chopra, who's our founder and chairman now. And uh, it's a very interesting company. It's one of the most prominent uh, companies in travel and hospitality software as a service mm-hmm. business. Mm-hmm. And Readgain has three large service lines or product lines. Mm-hmm. The first one is around revenue management and business intelligence. Mm-hmm. The second is around electronic distribution. Okay. And the third is where we do digital marketing. The common theme is across the travel and hospitality spectrum, we help companies make more money. Okay. And um, it's possibly the third or fourth largest SaaS company in India. And it's very rewarding because what we're doing is very tough. We're trying to build a products business out of India. Today, Rategain employs about 750 people. We are in more than 10 countries. And uh, we have customers in over 191 countries. Amazing. So it's very interesting. You know, I've heard many companies say that we want you to uh, have more efficient operations. We want you to be able to deliver better to customers. We want you to have uh, zero inventory. I like your comment that we help you to make more money. Very simply. That's the only vision we have. Incredible. Incredible. And are you able to quantify that? Yes. Yes. So one of the use cases we have is we power dynamic pricing for companies. Mm -hmm. So when you see the prices change on online travel agencies or hotel sites, uh, that's actually our machine learning AI algorithms which are driving the Mm -hmm. price change. Mm -hmm. Because it's changing dramatically. Yes. From the traditional big box hotels to your Airbnbs of the world and the Oreos of the world and so on. How is rate gain adapting to this incredible change that is taking place? So hospitality and travel has not changed for many years. And then suddenly in the last five years, it's seen a massive change. Correct. Uh, one of the fastest growing segments in the world is a traveler segment called millennials. Correct. Um, it's almost growing at 30-40% year on year. 54% millennials don't want to stay in a hotel. Yeah. They want to stay in uh, what is called non-hotel accommodation yeah. or alternate accommodation or vacation home rentals. stays. Yeah, home stays. So Redgain and most of these home stays and vacation rentals are individual owners who rent their houses out. Uh, they are not very tech savvy. Mm-hmm. They don't understand pricing or distribution. So one of the biggest efforts which Redgain is doing is digitizing this independent ecosystem okay. and helping them connect with millennials, get bookings from millennials, market to millennials better. Mm-hmm. The second big change is, uh, if you actually think about distribution, most uh, hotels know the large uh, OTAs like Expedia, Booking, uh, very well, C-Trip. But there are a lot of emerging OTAs, tour operators, which these hotel chains have not heard of. Mm -hmm. And uh, so how do we use uh, machine learning AI to bring this insight intelligence to them and allow them to connect seamlessly? So we also believe we are in the business of reducing friction in the traveler journey. Okay. So we want to create frictionless travel experiences. So our which state, means seamlessly move from exactly. one uh, experience to the other. Exactly. Absolutely. And from inspiration to rebooking. Okay. So you draw inspiration by discovering a hotel on TripAdvisor uh, or any social media platform. Uh, you look at reviews, then you book it. Uh, then there is whole the, the pre-booking on property and off property experience mm-hmm. and how do we enable you to rebook it again yeah yeah very, very interesting so let's move to your second avatar which is as an angel investor yes. you know you are obviously investing in a lot of companies so my first question to you as an angel investor is uh, at what stage and there are a lot of startup entrepreneurs who will be watching uh, your show at what stage should a startup investor start to look for funding? I've often heard this comment that take money whenever it's available. What are your thoughts? I've also heard that, but you know, at the same time, we have lots of amazing bootstrapped success stories out of India. Correct. And I would say, if God has given you the ability and resources to bootstrap it, uh, it's definitely a great idea to bootstrap it mm-hmm. because it's your own money. It teaches you frugality. Uh, it teaches you uh, adequate consideration for the resources. And then when you figure out uh, a very good product market fit, uh, unit economics are working well, Mm. uh, and you want to grow very fast in a short period of time, uh, think of uh, VC or angel money as the nitrogen oxide, which drives your car and gives it that extra boost. 
so that you can get that spurt of growth. Mm. The other important reason is uh, if you feel that if you don't raise money, mm. they're going to be your business model is proven, your, your unit economics is working. There will suddenly be some deep rooted, very well funded players who are going to come in and eat your market share. Okay. That's another good reason mm. to raise money. Yeah. Yeah. Interesting. So as an angel investor, what do you look for in a business plan? So interestingly, even before the business plan, the first thing I look for is uh, the founder or the founding team. Okay. Uh, what is the kind of background do they have? Mm -hmm. uh, will they have resilience? Mm -hmm. Any kind of business will go through many downturns, pivots, changes, uh, really tough days. Mm -hmm. Will they have the resilience to stay the course mm -hmm. and figure out a way? Okay. Uh, the way I look at the business plan is the business plan will change many times even over the course of years. Mm -hmm. So over a 30 slide deck, uh, it really will have no meaning. Mm -hmm. Then when you look at the business plan, once you're okay with the founding team and you feel they're great, they will stay the course and they have a spark to build a good business. Then of course you look at uh, three things. You look at desirability, which means is there a product market fit? Uh, you look at feasibility, and you look at viability. Okay. So feasibility is, is this the team which can build a product service solution which can meet this product market needs? Correct. And uh, can they do it in a viable manner? Mm. So I come from the Marwadi community. Yeah. So we are businessmen for many, many generations. And we strongly value strong PNL, unit economics, yes. ability to make money. Yes. Mm. Very true. Very true. And what about the fourth parameter, which is an exit? So I think there are two kinds of investors. There are investors uh, who invest in companies where they can get a quick exit between five to seven years or maybe even mm -hmm. earlier. Mm -hmm. And there are investors who have a more longer term view. Mm -hmm. I think I'm more on the Warren Buffet school of management okay. where or investing where I believe that I want to invest in companies which are going to be there for 100 years, which are going to become very big. So my investing style is uh, invest to hold, invest to grow and at times reinvest also. So uh, I've been fortunate enough to get good exits. Mm -hmm. So we sold Innovate to OYO. Mm -hmm. and, uh, but at the same time, if the, if the founder wanted to run the business, I would have stayed invested. So uh, a question to you on startups then, you know, it is believed or not believed, I mean, there's data which says that nine out of 10 startups don't make it. Yeah. Um, what do you think is the reason for that? So I've read somewhere that 70% of startups fail in the first uh, three years due to working capital issues. Mm -hmm. uh, and I would define working capital slightly broadly. Either they don't raise enough money um, or they don't have enough revenue mm -hmm. or they spend even before they have it. Mm -hmm. And it's a very hard lesson mm -hmm. which founders learn when they start their first business that you have to keep a very sharp eye on cash in hand. Correct. And cash is the king and you can show a lot of revenue, but if you don't collect, you don't collect on time and uh, you end up spending when you don't have cash in hand, it could lead you. So that's one of the biggest reasons. Mm -hmm. uh, the second reason which I see is uh, they start believing whatever is leading them to success is what will keep them there. Mm -hmm. And they get very uh, deeply entrenched in their own ideas. They start believing their own Kool-Aid. So do you have the intellectual humility to pivot and make changes uh, in the fastest, most efficient manner? Correct. So these are the two major reasons why I see startups failing. And what about founders? You know, uh, you said you'd want to look at the background of founders. Yeah. What are your thoughts on a single founder versus a co-founder? Uh, both kinds of founders have been phenomenally successful globally. Mm -hmm. But I am more on the camp of uh, a founding team versus a single founder. Yeah. Because entrepreneurship is a very tough and lonely journey. You yourself started Guardian Pharmacy, you would know that. And at times having a, a co-founder or two or three co-founders, three I would say is an ideal number, mm -hmm. really helps you because you might be strong in operations or finance or sales and marketing. Mm -hmm. And the other founders, co-founders bring the complementary skill. Mm -hmm. Secondly, uh, you could be feeling burnt out when yep. they step in. So I am more on the camp of having two or three co-founders. Because I've heard 
very differing views. People have come on our show and said only one founder. People have said two founders. You, I am on the gap of having two or three. Years. Yeah, three interesting. more, any more than three is a crowd, and one I would say is worrying. Okay. Yeah. Wonderful. You know something as simple as if you were to be hit by a bus, my investment goes down completely. Mm. Mm. So one more question for on on startups and uh, investing. Uh, you did mention some other areas where startup found mis- you know make mistakes, but what are some of the basic mistakes in your experience? A lot of startup founders make. So I think uh, one of the biggest challenges with startup space is brand trust. Brand? Brand trust. Okay. You're starting a new brand. Uh, most of the categories either exist, so you're doing a version, mm-hmm. which is you're solving a pain point, uh, or you're entering a new category where people don't even see a demand right now. So you have to really, really be quality conscious under promise and over deliver and even if it costs you money you have to have to deliver on the brand promise mm-hmm. so i think this is the place where a lot of startups face issues and they often get it wrong and i've seen some companies do it really really well and brand promise is everything so let me just stop you for a minute and let's talk a little bit on brand promise how many pro- promoters understand what is their brand promise so I think a lot of promoters have a fuzzy sense of what is the brand promise. Uh, if you ask them to articulate it in two or three crisp lines, mm-hmm. a lot of them aren't able to. Correct. And uh, brand promise is one part. Uh, and also what is the brand equity and how do they want it to carry ahead? A lot of them are challenged with it. Mm-hmm. And uh, they end up taking shortcuts because there is pressure from investors uh, or from colleagues mm-hmm. uh, to save that quick buck. It doesn't help. Okay. Okay. So it's always better to under promise over deliver when you're building mm-hmm. and build the brand on very strong foundations. Okay. So that's a very interesting comment you've made about brand promise. What is the other one that you... So the other thing I really believe is uh, not enough focus on building a team which will scale with them. Uh, team is everything. Uh, if it's a great team, your product will become better, your operations will be- become better, you'll become financially more efficient. So uh, hiring is the most important thing, which I always tell my investing companies they should be doing. It's not really focusing on product or operations or customer success. If you hire well, 80-90% of your problems are solved. Mm-hmm. And I see a lot of startups struggling to hire well. Either they panic and hire because they're growing very fast or the founders and senior management personally are not investing time in hiring but have delegated it down. Mm-hmm. Uh, or the third thing is just hiring versus resume value versus really solid competencies and skills. But tell me, you know, one of the classical challenges every startup faces, and I, I used to face that myself, is that you want to hire the best, but you can't afford the best. So I think, I think um, it's a fallacy to think that the best means the most expensive. Okay. A lot of people equate quality with price. Okay. You would also have a lot of people uh, who are either from premier colleges or not from premier colleges who are willing to take a cut mm-hmm. and join for the right purpose and cause. Okay. So as a founder, uh, are you able to articulate the larger vision and get them to believe in the short term, uh, the short term pain mm-hmm. and sacrifices which they need, they will need to do for a glorious future. Okay. If you cannot articulate the three-year short-term sacrifices for the five, ten years glorious future, then you will struggle. That's to very, very well said. I mean, I'm, I had some amazing learnings in the last 15, 20 minutes from you. So let's move on. You know, you, uh, Apu, you're, a, you're an author and you've got two published books. Tell me about these books. So the first book is called uh, You Are the Key, Unlocking Doors Through Social Selling, okay. uh, which was published by Bloomsbury. Mm-hmm. And the foreword was written by... Uh, our Prime Minister Modi and uh, I I moved back from US and I was seeing in US we had a lot of solopreneurs, photographers, chefs, designers, consultants. In India, the larger trend was either your employee or now in the last seven, eight years, you were starting enterprises. We still have a lot of unemployment. Mm-hmm. 
and i felt that if people learn to create their own brands and interestingly your show is called the brand called you they can become solo preneurs okay and this book was to help uh, solo preneurs uh, or even founders and investors and politicians learn to use social media to create their own brand okay so there are locked doors and if you're a brand you can unlock any door correct and social media allows you to create that brand mm. and i wanted to offer everybody a key which allows them to unlock the potential of social media amazing the second book was called uh, master growth hacking mm. so master, i know sorry master growth hacking master growth hacking yeah wow okay so the best kept secrets of indian startups okay and this was released by penguin random house okay and uh, so once i had done this i started meeting a lot of entrepreneurs and a lot of people that i had told me they found the book very useful and wrote to me on linkedin uh i started seeing a lot of companies in india mm-hmm. uh and globally getting disrupted by startups mm-hmm. and not really figuring out what is happening mm-hmm. you had brands like wow momo mama earth many others mm-hmm. uh checkbook lucidius a lot of startups coming out of nowhere doing very well very frugally and growing very fast mm. and people from these big mncs or indian houses sitting and getting hit from all directions Correct. and not really being able to answer questions and i i could see this trend accelerating so i had a lot of experience as a investor uh, and in my experiments with hcl and at rate gain uh, using digital to grow a business and i started interviewing a lot of founders like you're doing mm. and a lot of digital marketing gurus and growth hackers uh and surprisingly uh, a lot of people said that you know I, i can tell you but please don't write about it because that's our secret sauce mm. and a lot of people flatly refused and said there's no way i'm going to share what we are doing mm. uh i was fortunate enough to get time from 60 70 uh, digital marketing gurus mm. founders mm. and out of that a lot of learnings so the book features 10 case studies okay uh so it features india mart zomato uh policy bazaar mm. uh witty feed mm. on how have these companies across 10 different sectors and scale mm. from a listed company like india mart yeah uh done growth hacking very interesting so one more question about uh, i'm assuming showcause.org is an ngo yeah um which is for accessible healthcare yeah tell me about this initiative of yours so a bunch of us uh, got together and we started this uh, and we really felt that uh, you know india the problem is the healthcare problem is too big for just government to solve Correct. uh and i know there are ngos doing very good work mm-hmm. but we really wanted to see if we could pick up causes in healthcare which are uh, slivers of issues existing mm-hmm. and bring a lot of spotlight on it and try solving it like one of the causes which we are championing is um how do we get uh testing uh before marriage uh mandatory okay uh like if you're hiv positive or you have some kind of disease uh can we bring a level of transparency in india where people are voluntarily disclosing this and can we spread awareness around it right so there are many causes and we have been doing blood donation camps we have been doing uh, all kinds of check up camps and we are getting a lot of support from uh, both the civic society uh, and from healthcare companies okay. my first question would be that in the absolutely incredible career you have so far have you had any people who have had an influence on your life and if yes what have you learned from them So the biggest influence in my life is my grandfather okay Shri Sitaram Chamadia ji uh so he was born in Rajasthan and he was adopted at a very early age okay. so we come from this place called Churu and Churu was uh, very cold or famine struck and there was really no uh, livelihood there so he left uh, his adopted family when he was 10 or 11 and hitchhiked all the way uh to different states looking for some work to do mm-hmm. and finally landed up in bihar very finally settled mm-hmm. uh, as a very young man he participated in the freedom struggle mm-hmm. uh he built a small business he went on to become uh, 
the MLA and MLC, in fact, when he passed away two years ago, uh, the state government observed a, a day of mourning for him and the flags were flown at half mast. Amazing. And if a person who's had such a tough childhood uh, was adopted, had to leave home when he was 10, 11, uh, go across states not knowing anybody. Yeah. And my grandfather always told me, he said, you know, I had nothing and I built something out of nothing. Uh, even today, when he was 70, 75, he always said that even today, if I lose everything, I have the grit to build it again. Correct. So I feel very uh, privileged that all my childhood, I stayed with him, I learned from him. And I think he's been a big inspiration. Amazing. Amazing. So for my last question to you, and this is on failure. Uh, most of us in India, or yeah. for that matter in Asia, yeah. don't teach our children that it is okay to fail. Yeah. We all say, yeah. you have to come first. And yet we keep failing. Yeah. All of us have yeah. failed all the time. So my question to you is, what have been some of your learnings from some of your mistakes or your failures? I I've, I've fail almost daily hmm. in trying to convince my wife and many other things. <laughs> that we all do. <laughs> that we all do. So on a more serious, no, serious note, I would say... Um, this whole deep inculcated fear of failing Correct. and the social stigma around being a failure is gradually reducing in India. Mm -hmm. uh, it's okay to lose a job. It's okay to fail. Uh, but I would go to the other extreme. Mm -hmm. I would say, is it possible for us uh, as individuals, as founders, as responsible members of the society to actually encourage our children, our friends, our peers, our seniors, to actually take large risks uh, and of course strategic well thought out risks mm -hmm. where the chances of failure are high mm -hmm. and the chances of success are also high. Okay. And uh, uh, one of my previous bosses defined it very well. He said, Apur, in a year if you're not taking one or two, three bets which involve a reputational risk mm -hmm. like where people will say, oh my God, this was such a big failure. Mm -hmm. You're not thinking big enough. Correct. So a lot of people take bets or participate in initiatives uh, where it's okay. It doesn't make a meaningful difference mm -hmm. to them. So going back to your earlier question on why have I moved my career so many times and I work with a startup now. I've always said that when you're comfortable, that's the best time to challenge yourself, take okay. a risk. Okay. So I think we need a, uh, we need to really, really spread a lot of awareness around it. Mm -hmm. uh, there's a difference between being foolhardy and failing after trying very hard and Absolutely. giving it all. Yeah. Uh, the first thing is also when you want people to accept failure, mm -hmm. we have to build the right kind of uh, moral and professional values in them so that they don't fail because they have not applied themselves. Correct. Correct. When you apply it and give it all, it's okay to fail. Well said. Apu, thank you very much. Thank you so much, Ashish. It's been an absolute pleasure speaking to you. And I wish you all the best for a brand called you. Thank you. And to you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for listening to the Brand Called You podcast. Be sure to visit tbcy.in to join the conversation, access show notes, and discover fantastic bonus content. You can follow us on YouTube, Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. Simply search for the Brand Called You. Thank you and see you next week.